Welcome to Total MD. In today's video, we're going to go through setting up the system so you can customize it to meet the needs of your practice. When you first open Total MD after the installation, you will get a setup wizard in the middle of your screen that you can walk through that will do a lot of the same things I'm about to teach you. As we go through setting up the system, I'm going to discuss a little bit of navigation and layout of the program as well. To begin, the name of the screen you're in is always going to be listed here in this light blue section. The screens that you have available to jump to are listed right here at the top of the screen, and to access those it's just a single left click. We do have an options menu, and that's in this big blue section on the left hand side of the screen. The options that are available to you are going to populate based on the screen that you're in. So if you don't see an option for what you want, you may likely be in the wrong screen. I'm going to begin by clicking on Setup. Again, just a single left click to access that part of the program. Once the Total MD Setup page is open, I can go ahead and click on Set Up the Practice. Anything you see that's blue and underlined is a hyperlink and will open another screen for you. Now we're looking at the Program Preferences screen. A lot of places in the system use additional tabs so that we can click through and fill out that information. We're going to start with Practice Info. This is going to be the name of your office, and the address is going to be the address that you'd like to have displayed on the statements that you mail to your patients. So this is going to be the return billing address. You do have a space for a bank account number should you choose to put that in just as a holding tank option or also to print out on the deposit slip so that you could possibly use that deposit slip to take to the bank with your check and cash deposits. We also have a space here for default area code. If you plug something into that space, that means that every new patient you create will have that default area code for their phone number. You can write over it if it turns out that that is not their phone number. We're going to move on to schedule settings. This is going to limit what times are visible on the schedule to you. So if you ever work past five intentionally, make sure you open your schedule up to approximately six or so so that you give yourself time to schedule the appointment that overlaps past the five o'clock time frame, just as an example. So we are open Monday through Friday. These are just check boxes you'll mark and then put in each day's scheduled hours you can see that each day can have different hours available. The time interval is representing the lines on the scheduler that you are scheduling in. One line in this case is going to represent 15 minutes. You can change this to be 5 minutes, 10, or even 30 depending on how your practice schedules. The higher you go in minutes here as far as the time interval, the more that you will see on your schedule. So if you work 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. and you set the time interval to 5 minutes, you're going to have a really long schedule to look at. If you work 7 to 6 and you have your time interval set at 30 minutes, that's going to be an average looking day that you scroll through. The time height is going to factor into how much scrolling you do when you look on your schedule as well and also how visible each line line is on the scheduler. Time height is increasing the size if you increase the time height so that you can see each line's information in a larger format. We do have a section here for appointment color names. We can utilize pastel colors which is just going to be a lighter version of our original colors. The purpose of the appointment colors is to attach a color to an appointment for example, I could specify purple to represent new patients, and then I attach the purple color to my new patient's appointment. And then the whole office knows that we have two purple patients today, which equals two new patients today, just by glancing at the scheduler. So it's a nice visual cue without having to read the details on each appointment or open up each appointment to find out what the nature of that appointment is. The appointment color only sticks to that one individual appointment, so the scheduler could have an array of colors on it. The way you set a master list of colors is by choosing the color and off to the side, I'm going to remove the word purple and put in new patient. Now, when scheduling the appointment, when you go to select a color, you'll be able to see very quickly that purple represents new patient. We do have 20 colors in the system that you can choose from. Down below, we have the option to block the schedule so that no one can schedule more than so many days in advance. 
You also have a few additional options down here to hide the patient's name on the scheduled appointment. What that will do is display their chart number instead of the patient's name on each appointment. Use resource scheduling. What that means is you can attach a column to the appointment or a resource as we call it instead of a provider to the appointment. That way if you have designated rooms in your office and you name the columns on the schedule based on those rooms, you'll know which patient is in what room if you do choose to do resource scheduling. If you just have two providers and they work out of whatever rooms are open and available, then you don't need to use the resource scheduling. We also have the option to show the patient's last name first instead of their first name and then their last name. Here in the middle section, we have displayed appointment information. Each appointment is capable of having six line items of information that is set on every appointment. You can click the drop down menu and go through these items and see what works for you and you put them in order based on how you wanna see them. So my personal preference is to see the patient's phone number first. The second line I have is patient responsible balance. What that means is it's gonna show me the patient's responsible portion after the insurance has paid that claim. My third line is what is the patient's copay? My fourth line of displayed information is the date the appointment was created. My fifth line is the age of the patient and what insurance they have. And my sixth line is the note section. So if I make a note on the appointment, such as patient may be five minutes late, when looking at the appointment and hovering over the appointment, I'll be able to see that note rather than having to open up that appointment to read the note section. You can play around with these and see what works best for your option. These are just suggestions um, based on what seems to make sense for the masses. On the right hand side of the screen we have dates the office is closed. To add a holiday in here or a closed day where the whole office just shuts down because the doctors are perhaps out at continuing education, you're just going to click the add option, select the date or type it in if you prefer. We'll just go with November 10th and then plug in a description just so everyone will know why the office is closed that day. Doctors out for continuing ed. And hit your save button. Now on the 10th of November, that day will be blocked out. If you hover over that date on the calendar, it's gonna give you this little blurb that the doctors are out for continuing education. If you have recurring holidays, such as Christmas, that always falls on the same date, after that date passes, you can simply go back to this section and edit the closed date and change the year on it if you'd like. The alternative is to add another date with the alternate year in place. Moving forward to program settings, we've got a couple additional options here at the top of the system. You can use the Enter tab to move through each line item that we have on the screen, or the Tab button works as well. This is to show the global pop-up message so that you have an idea of the global period. Auto-calculate ledger balances, which will save you a lot of time and energy. Show patient alert message, such as any medical alerts they might have, or if they come in a wheelchair and need a ramp placed to get in the office, anything to that effect can become an alert message. You can manually search for your patient. Manual searching is a default option that I'd suggest leaving on. And then we have the option to create numeric chart numbers in the system. If you don't create a numeric chart number, the automatic chart numbers that get generated are based on the patient's name. It's the first three characters of their last name and then the first two characters of their first name and then a unique three digit number that changes based on who else has the same first five characters. For example, my name is Alicia McKinney. My chart number would be MCKAL000. No two people will ever have the same chart number. You can choose to create your own chart numbers at the moment of the new patient creation if you'd like to. It just does get a little difficult to keep track of what previous chart numbers you've already used. So keep that in mind. We do have a section here to set your idle minutes for your login. So after 10 minutes, my system is going to log me out 
and I'll have to log back in when I come back to the desk. We have a couple transaction detail options here, such as multiply by units and save the contracted allowed amount per transaction. We'll talk about these more once we get to the ledger. We do have a space here to set up a default facility where treatment takes place and also a default provider. If you have multiple providers in the practice that you bill out under, you're not going to want to set a default provider unless the majority of them still go under one person. The default facility in most cases does apply, and this is the facility that will populate your claim form. However, you can change that out on the patient's billing if, for example, you saw the patient in the hospital instead of at your office instead of the program level. The same is true for the provider. We do have a section here for taxes if your office does charge taxes to enable calculating tax manually or enable auto tax. I did go ahead and punch in a tax rate here for my auto tax. And we do have a tax code so that that additional percent that's added onto the bill is displayed as being tax. Next, we have a space here for eligibility information, such as what clearinghouse you use to electronically send your claims through. We have two companies that we work with directly, Apex and Gateway. Although you can set up directories to send e-claims through to other companies, it's just a couple extra clicks to get those out, and that is something that tech support can help you with. We have a space here for collections information, and this is also something tech support can help you with. If you do have a collections company that you work with, um, we can send data directly out of the system and over to that collections agency. We also have a space designated for your Doctor First credentials, which is for e-prescribing to send electronic prescriptions out of the system directly to the pharmacy of your choosing. This is something that tech support would set up with you after you sign up for e-prescribing with one of our sales representatives. And then lastly, claim edit verification. When would you like our system to scrub the claim and check for errors? When the claim is created? Never. Or before the claim is printed or sent? The default is when the claim is created, which in most cases I would suggest leaving that way. The next tab over is the statement messages. The statements are what you send to the patient as a bill or a statement so that you can collect money from them. We do have a space for a common message if you want to give them some sort of greeting or tell them to have a fantastic fall. And then the Dunning messages are the messages that print out by default on the statement based on the age of their account. We do have some default data in here. If you'd like to edit that, it's simply a click and type and you can manipulate this message in any way you'd like. You can also highlight over the message, right click on it, and change the font information on that message, such as the color, if you do have a color printer, the font style, the font itself, and the font size. 10 or 11 seems to be a size that people prefer on the statements. The next tab over is the email setup. You do have the opportunity to send out one type of email to your patients, and that is an email reminding them that they have an appointment coming up. You can edit this message by clicking and typing if you wanted to plug in your cancellation policy here. This email will grab and capture the patient's name, the date of the appointment, the time of the appointment, and what provider they're seeing automatically. This top section is where you'll plug in the email information as to what email this message is sending out from. You will want to talk to tech support as well to help you set this information up. The next tab over is EHR settings and anything related to EHR we are going to cover in one of our EHR videos. So at this point, I would click Save Changes from my Options menu for any data that I've plugged into my Program Preferences screen, and we can move on to the next section of Setup. The system does layer screen on top of screen, so what that means is once you save a screen, it closes it automatically. 
The screen that you see next is the screen that we had layered underneath the one that we opened. So it's easy to get back to the previous screens you had open. We also have a backward and a forward button here, just like an internet browser. So if I hit the back button, it takes me back to my home screen. And then I can go forward again to the setup screen. There is a drop down menu next to the back and forward button that will display what other screens you have open, either on top or on bottom of the screen that you're looking at. You can jump directly to one of those screens listed here instead of clicking back so many times just by selecting the screen that you want to go to. Next in our setup, we're going to take a look at setting up users for the program. It's important to set up users so that your patient's data is secured with a username and a password and you know what staff members are making what changes. You can find out which staff did what by running an audit trail report in our report section of the system. I'm going to go ahead and click set up users and you can see I do have a few users already in the system. The user specified here is actually the login name that you will use. The name is just specifying who that login belongs to. And then the level is specifying what level of information and data they're allowed to add, edit, and delete. You'll want different types of staff members to be on different security levels. For example, the owner of the practice, you are most likely going to give security level 1 to, which is the highest level of security by default in our system. And then the office manager is most likely going to be a 2. The security should be set up by the highest level person in the office. To set up a user in the system, you go to the options menu and under modify data, you would click new user. We also have a hotkey of F8 if you do like to use the F keys on your keyboard. Once I click new user, I can simply plug in the name of the login I want to use, put in, punch in my full name so that everyone knows that that login belongs to me, and then go ahead and set a password. The password can be numbers or letters or a combination of characters and the password is also case sensitive. We have security levels one through five to choose from, one being the highest, five being the lowest. In the next section, we'll go ahead and define what those security levels are allowed to do. These additional sections are here to set up usernames and passwords for various items or additional programs that may link into the system. For example, TotalMD Direct is our patient portal that we can securely and directly email patients and other providers our patient's encounter form. So this provides a space for the username and password for this user to log into TotalMD Direct so you don't have an additional login every time you open up TotalMD Direct. This information is something that our tech support would fill out after you sign up for these items. Once you're done setting up the details to create a new user, you simply go to your options menu and click your Save Changes button. Then you can go on with creating another new user until you're done. Now that we have users set up in the system, we're going to go ahead and define their security. So I'll click Set Up Security. If we double click this first plus sign, we can see that the category is account and service codes. We have a space for what action you can take under that category. And then we have different levels that are or aren't allowed to take that action. So for example, we have new, edit, delete, and view list. New means these are the people selected that can create new account codes or new service codes in the system. Edit are the people that are allowed to edit those codes. Delete are the people allowed to delete those codes. And view list is simply who is allowed to view the list of account codes and service codes. Viewing the list does not mean that they can create new, edit, or delete. They're just allowed to see that list on display. You're going to click through each one of these plus signs and check and uncheck the boxes for who you're going to allow to do those assignments. I would suggest making a list of your users and what security level you have them on or what role you have them in and then decide 
what roles are going to be able to do which actions in the system. If you have any questions about this area and need additional assistance in setting it up or understanding some of these items, please feel free to call the training department. Once you are done setting up that section, you're gonna go ahead and save your changes from your options menu. The next section down is setting up providers. This is basically where you can enter in your doctors, your PAs, your MAs, and any other provider that you might want to attach to a record. To create a new provider, you're gonna to go to your options menu and click on new provider. So you can see we've got last name, first name, and credentials. The specialty will populate the specialty code for your claim form. We have the street address attached to that provider. That is the working address. And then we have the email information, office phone, home phone, mobile phone, if they participate in Medicare. The home phone and the mobile phone do not print out anywhere. That's just a space for you to hold that information for that provider. The same is true for the email address on that provider. Off to the right, we have an appointment color that you can choose for the provider. This is different than the appointment color that you attach based on the type of appointment the patient is having. This color will be displayed on the side of the appointment in a vertical format based on what provider that appointment is scheduled to be completed by. And then on your claim form, do you want to print the provider's name as the signature? Use signature on file or leave blank. If you're sending e-claims, you don't want to leave it blank. Eligibility ID is if you are doing real-time eligibility through your clearinghouse. The real-time eligibility is basically a way for you to check the patient's insurance benefits with a click of the button. So the eligibility ID is just the routing number that allows you to do so after you sign up for that feature. The direct address is going to be the direct email address or secured email address that this provider is assigned if you are using Total MD Direct. You can set up the provider and then choose to hide their name on the schedule if they're in there simply for billing purposes or you don't schedule based on providers. You do have a tab to put in that provider's work schedule and if you do schedule outside of the hours, you will get a pop-up that alerts you to the fact that you're scheduling outside of the provider's normal hours. Then we have an ID section for the state license number, tax ID number, DEA number, NPI number, group NPI numbers, etc. All of these numbers are possible to use to populate on your claim form. So this is the holding tank for all of the IDs for this provider. We do have an extra tab, which is designated just for extra information that you may want to keep on file. For example, I did put Mrs. Smith's name and phone number in this space in case we needed to contact the doctor's wife for anything. We also have a pins section. The PIN section is designed to work based off of the different insurance companies you have in your system, which we haven't got to yet. If we do enter an insurance company and that company asks for a unique PIN number such as the Blue Shield provider number on the claim form, the PIN is going to be the Blue Shield provider number that you populate here. Then you can specify if you participate or accept the assignment from the insurance. You only do labs with that insurance or neither. SOF is signature on file, and then this allows you to put in your acceptance option. This is essentially a way to attach an additional ID number to that insurance based on the qualifier or what that insurance company is asking for on the claim. There is another section to set up pins, so for now we're just going to escape out of this section and we'll discuss that when we get there. Once you are done creating your provider, of course, make sure you save your changes so you do save that provider to the system. Then you can click new provider and set up the next person. We're gonna go ahead and close out of that section and move on to the top right box, accounting setup. You're going to want to put your office fees into the system, so we'll start with setting up the fee schedule. 
Here we have 30 different potential fee schedules that you can create. And by default, you should have each of these fee schedules preloaded with the code list if you had purchased the CPT codes. The way this works is I'm going to edit the number one fee schedule, give it a name, which might be office fees, and then I would see the codes here on the left-hand side of the screen and populate the dollar amount I want to charge per code. It's important to know that whatever fee schedule you put in the number one position is going to be the default fee schedule used for all patients if you do not choose an alternate fee schedule for them. The alternate fee schedule is attached to the patient through the insurance plan. So whatever the standard fees are that you want to go off of, make sure you put that in the number one position. As you can see here, we don't really have any codes loaded into this system, which you can manually add the ones that you use if you have a short list of codes that you do use. Or, as I mentioned, you can go ahead and purchase the entire fee schedule. You can purchase the entire CPT code set, and those would automatically be loaded here. So, I'm gonna dive into setting up service codes, and click on that, and I'm gonna go to my options menu and click new service code. Now, a lot of you may already have your service codes in the system because you purchased the code set. There are some of you that may only use a handful of codes and so it wouldn't make sense necessarily to purchase the whole code set and you just want to enter the ones that you do use. So just for the sake of showing you how to create a new code in the system, this is going to be a service code or a fee for service code. I'm gonna go ahead and show you that first, then we'll get into fee schedules. So I'm gonna put in our 99213 and very generically, I'm just going to label this office visit. I know the actual description is a little more in depth, but we're going to keep it simple. And then the type of code is what's really important here because the type of code is going to determine what space this code shows up in or what drop down menu it shows up in. So if you're in the diagnosis list, you don't want that code to show up as a diagnosis because it's not. It's a fee for service code. So in that case, we're going to choose fee for service. You can create any kind of code from the service code list. The type that you select for that code will determine where that code ultimately goes. So if you are needing to make a code and you forget where to go, the default can always be the service code list. So I'm gonna select it's a fee for service code. And once I select the type, we get the additional options that pertain to that type of code. So I can select a service category as to where I want that code to show up under. It just makes it easier for you to search later if you know all of your office visit codes are under the office visit category. Your surgery codes are all under the surgery category, etc. So we can scroll through this list and obviously I'm gonna just go ahead and pick off this visit. You can put in default modifiers for the code you're creating. This one, it doesn't make sense to add a modifier to, but if this were a service code for setting or splinting a broken finger or something else to that effect that may require a modifier, you can go ahead and punch that in here as a default modifier attached to that code. If you don't attach a modifier here, you can attach it on the patient's ledger when you're using that code. You don't have to keep a default modifier. You can add a modifier as needed. Default units, how many units of this item are you doing? And then you could choose the measurement of those units. Type of service code, place of service code. We'll just choose 11 for office. And then a revenue code. And then we have a global period. I'm gonna go ahead and just put 30 days in that global period. You can make the code a do not bill insurance code. So for example, if this is just a product you sell and you're not gonna bill it to the insurance company, you can mark it do not bill insurance and you can also make it a taxable code as well. We have alternate codes that you can attach here to this code. So if for example, you have a 99213, and you want to create a 99213 with a secondary fee attached, you could label it a 99213.3 in creating that service code and then use that as an alternate code here. 
Now, I don't have any other codes set up yet, so I can't put in a 99213.3 because it doesn't exist. You do have a space for the NDC number if, if that does apply. You have a space for supplemental information, and then you could put this in a certain super bill group once all the data is in the system. You want to market a vaccine, you do have additional information down here for vaccines. Now, this is one way that you can enter the fee per code, although I recommend doing it this way when you're adding just one code in here and there. So under fee amounts, fee schedule number one, I would just type in what we're going to charge for this item. We could say $50. Moving on to contract amounts, I get this pop-up. This account code must be saved before continuing save now. I'm going to go ahead and say yes. And if we had any insurance plans in the system already, it would allow us to see this code and put in what that insurance plan contracts that item to be. Since we don't, we're going to obviously go ahead and skip that. And we'll close the screen because we already said yes to saving the code. If we did not click contract amounts, we would have clicked save changes just above the close option before exiting the screen. Now we've got a code in here. It's a fee for service code and we're charging $50. I'm going to go ahead and close this screen and now take you up to setting up the fee schedule. Once you have all the codes in the system, you're going to want to put in your fee schedule for what your office is going to charge for all those codes. So whatever you have in the number one position is going to be your defaulted fee schedule. What that means is if you have a patient that comes in without any insurance, they're just going to pay you cash, this is the fee schedule that by default is attached to them. The only way to attach an alternate fee schedule to someone is to create an insurance plan and connect the new fee schedule to the insurance plan. To set up the fee schedules, which you have 30 possible fee schedules you could create, you just select the position you want to edit. So this is has number one selected because one is highlighted in blue. And then you simply click Edit Fee Schedule from the Options menu. You're going to want to name this fee schedule, so I'm going to call it Office Fees. And you'll see all of your codes listed out here. Basically, find the code, go to the right, and type in the dollar amount you want to charge. Since I had already typed in the dollar amount for this one, I'm going to pull up fee schedule number two. I'm going to pull up fee schedule number two and edit that fee schedule and name this discount fees. Perhaps um, this is a 10% discounted fee schedule. I have two ways I can figure out a 10% off fee schedule. I can hand calculate each dollar amount and type in the 10% off, or I can copy the original fee schedule by hitting copy fee schedule, selecting the fee schedule I want to copy, and then putting in what percent of that fee schedule I want to copy into space number two. So I'm going to say 90% of fee schedule number one. And now it's automatically calculated for me for all of the codes you have in place what a 90% fee schedule of fee schedule number one looks like. So this is a 10% off fee schedule. And then I just save my changes. That is setting up your fee schedules. So you can put in all the contracted fee schedules in here that you'd like or any other different types of fee schedules you want to use. I want to just click on set up service classes really quick and show you that this is where we're holding the different categories that the codes show up under. So that office visit code I created is under the office visit category. If you wanted to create a new service class or service category, you click on new in the options menu. And these other ones are labeled um, either with numbers or with wording. So this one I'm going to just name products or prod because we can't type the whole word. And the name of this category is going to be products. And we save our changes. Now if we create product codes in the system, we want to make sure that those end up under the product class. So that's a quick one to get through. I'm going to go ahead and take a look at setting up diagnosis codes, setting up account codes, and then we'll jump back to insurance plans. Mm -hmm. Getting into setting up diagnosis codes, once again, this is 
an option for you to manually enter diagnosis codes, but you can purchase the diagnosis codes from us and we'll load them all into the system for you. To create a new diagnosis code, I'm going to go to my options menu and click new code. I'm going to put in the official diagnosis code I want to enter. I believe diabetes uh, for ICD-9 might be 250.02. Gonna punch in a description. And once again, I have an option to add it to the Superbill group. Create alternate coding for that. So if there's another code set that I might wanna use, I could create a second code set. And then if this were an ICD-10 code, this is very important, you're gonna go ahead and mark ICD-10. I know this is not an ICD-10 code, it's an ICD-9 code, so I'm going to leave it unchecked and save my changes. Now I've got an ICD-9 code in the system. I take a minute to go ahead and look up the ICD-10 code for diabetes online. There's a website, icd10data.com. Now let's go ahead and say that the ICD-10 code for diabetes is Z13.1. I'm going to go ahead and pull up TotalMD again, create a new code, type it in, Z13.1. I'm going to label it diabetes. I'm going to make it an ICD-10 code. And the ICD-9 link allows me to select the ICD-9 code that has converted to this 10 code. That way, you can look up the 10 code without having to know it. So it's a way for you to get the code you need a little more quickly. We also have the opportunity to convert the ICD-9 codes to 10 codes if for some reason you haven't done that already or gotten the ICD-10 code list. I'm going to go ahead and save our changes. And now I've got both the ICD-9 code, which is not marked ICD-10, and then I have the ICD-10 code with the ICD-9 link. Now I want to show you something else as far as what you can do in a lot of in all of these list screens. Each one of these is customizable. So right now we're looking at the diagnosis code list which I got to through setup but I wanted to point out now that you can also get there through the list menu. If I go to customize our filter, I can add in different searchable options on how to find the code I'm looking for. I like to have code as a searchable option, description, ICD-10, and ICD-9 link. So if I add all of those to the screen up here at the top, I say I only want to see my ICD-10 codes, and it shows me just ICD-10 ready codes. If I know the ICD-9 code but not the 10 code, I could click ICD-9 link and type in my 250.02 and it shows me the ICD-10 linked code. So those are some handy options for you to add to your screen. You can also customize your view, which um, this screen, there isn't a whole lot to add, but a lot of these other list screens, that's going to come in handy. The view are these little blue headings that we're looking at. So if I click Customize View, I can add in the date the code was created from our available fields, move that to the right into our viewed fields, click OK, and now I have date created as um, a blue heading in our view. You can also reorder these items, so you just click and hold your mouse down and drag it to the side, wherever you would like it. And then you can also resort your data by these codes. So this little drop down arrow is telling you how this code list is sorted. It's by code in descending order. If I click it again, it'll be by code in ascending order. All of these are clickable and that will come in handy if you need to alphabetize a list or search by something in particular. Now closing out of this screen, jumping back over to our account code setup, I want to get into setting up actual account codes which are adjustment and payment codes. There are also note codes to add a descriptor to any type of other code that you might add to the patient's ledger. This does come with a default set of account codes such as insurance adjustment, insurance check payment, and etc. 
you'll notice that it just says patient credit card payment. You may, for example, want to add in patient visa payment, patient MasterCard payment, American Express, and Discover, so that you can choose how they paid you, not just generically say credit card. So to create a new account code, I'm going to go to my options menu and click new account code. I'm going to put in a little code descriptor, so I'll say PAT for patient and visa for visa payment, and the description is going to be patient visa payment. Again, the type of code is vital here. You notice we do have fee for service as an option, etc. We're going to skip past that to put it in as a patient credit card payment and save our changes. Now, when you go to post a patient's payment, you'll have patient visa payment as a code type to choose from. The only codes that it's going to show you are account codes in that payment screen. It is important to make sure you have any kind of discount codes, adjustment codes, any kind of note codes that you want in the system, such as senior citizen discount or 10% courtesy if you're not using a 10% off fee schedule. You may also want to add insurance refund to this list and different types of note codes such as insurance rejected due to not a covered benefit or insurance maximum reached. So if I want to create a new note code, I'm going to click new account code and I'm going to put INS for insurance and max and type in my description insurance max reached no coverage. And then the type of code this is is going to be a note code and save my changes. So here's our little note code and you can apply that to any patient's ledger now. If you have additional questions about account codes, you can always contact the training department and we'll be more than happy to help you set up some more. Next under accounting setup is entering insurance plans. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. You do not have to enter all of your insurance plans through the setup screen, it's important to know that. If you have a new patient that comes in and it's a new insurance plan than any of the other plans you've entered, you can enter it through the patient information screen or by going to the list menu and insurance plan list. If you do it through the patient information screen, obviously it's pretty quick just to attach it to the patient after you've created it. I'll be showing you that way in another video. So to create a new insurance plan, you go to your options menu and click new insurance plan. The computer will assign the code for you in this situation unless you want to create your own that might correspond to some numbering system you're already familiar with. The assigned codes will be based on the first three letters of the insurance plan name and then a unique two-digit character. So for example, a Blue Cross Blue Shield plan would be BLU00. The second Blue Cross Blue Shield plan would be BLU01, so on and so forth. I'm going to go ahead and put in the name of the insurance plan, the claims mailing address, along with their claims phone number, and the computer will format any phone numbers for you so you don't have to put any dashes or spaces in. If there's a fax number or a contact person that you'd like to plug in, go ahead. and. Off to the side, if there is a group name that should apply, go ahead and plug that in. I'm going to say this is with Kraft. Group number, again, should that apply? Is it a local plan? Yes or no? And then what fee schedule would you like to attach to this insurance plan? Whatever fee schedule you do enter here will show up on the patient's ledger for billing purposes. So keep that in mind. If you're not contracted with the insurance company, do not enter their fee schedule here or you will be losing money for the office. By default, the number one fee schedule will populate in this space even if you leave it blank. This just gives you an opportunity to attach the Blue Cross Blue Shield fee schedule if you are contracted and you want to bill the patient the maximum allowed amount instead of your office fees and adding adjustments in. We could pretend that the number three fee schedule is the Blue Cross fee schedule, but I'm just gonna go ahead and stick with office fees in this situation. You do have a space for the payer ID number if you are filing electronic claims, you will need to populate this. And you also have a space for the eligibility ID number. That is basically a routing number to check the patient's insurance eligibility in real time. 
you will be able to get the eligibility ID number from the clearinghouse that you sign up with. And you'll plug that in if that's something that you do sign up for. Insurance type is important to fill out. It's going to give us some options for PPO, HMO, indemnity, Medicare, Medicaid, etc. We do have a space here for timely filing periods. So I could put in 60 to represent 60 days for timely filing. And then you also have an optional space for category. The category is a way that you can group different insurance plans together. And there are certain reports where you can filter the data that you receive based on the category that you choose. A category option could be something like PPO and mark all your PPO plans appropriately and then run a report based on the category of PPO. It could be as simple as the number one being a category or it could be any kind of character that makes sense to you. So if there's a certain type of plan or a certain plan that you're tracking for a specific reason, you can filter certain insurance reports by that category. Check eligibility is just saying, yes, we're doing real-time eligibility with this insurance plan. And same should apply for sending electronic claims. You can choose a claims module, which company did you go with? And then you have some different indicators down here at the bottom, SBR05 and SBR09. Choose whatever makes sense in this situation based on the insurance plan that you're creating. I'm going to go ahead and say that this is a commercial plan and it's a PPO commercial plan. This middle section is editable and basically it's saying on box 33 of your CMS insurance claim form it's going to populate the provider's information. You do have the option to plug in the practice information for this plan instead if they do require practice details instead of provider details. Um, the same applies for all of these other box indicators. Box 24, you can attach the individual's NPI number or the group NPI number, and so on and so forth. The default that is set up in here is appropriate for most insurance plans. Here you have the option to choose an alternate code set and attach that code set to this insurance plan. So I showed you how you can create an alternate code and attach it to your existing codes. This is where you select which code set you want to use. If that insurance plan is using ICD-10 codes, make sure you do mark accepts ICD-10. Some offices may need to create an alternate fee schedule. Um, for example, the discount fee schedule for cash patients, and they may need to attach that fee schedule to your cash patient. So, if we choose discounted fees, let's ignore all this other data that is pertaining to an insurance plan right now. We can create an insurance plan, quote unquote, that's actually a discounted fee schedule. So I would name this discount fees, and then I would mark this a, as a do not bill insurance plan. So just know that that's an option to attach a different fee schedule to your patient. And I just jump back to office fees. If this is a Medicaid patient and you will not be billing the patient for anything, you do have the option to mark this insurance plan as a do not bill patient option. There is a section here to put in default payment codes and adjustment codes. So we could create additional coding that said Blue Cross Blue Shield check payment instead of generically insurance check payment if that's something you'd like. And then by default choose the new Blue Cross Blue Shield check payment code to be the default for this insurance plan. We're going to go ahead and leave that as is for now. And in the notes section, this is where you're going to put any frequencies and limitations of the plan. So for example, if the patient is allowed to have two office visits per year, I personally like to right click and insert a date and time stamp so I know how up to date this information is and then punch in two office visits per year. This information does populate in various places throughout the system, so it's great to note that down here. If I go ahead and click to the Contract Allowed tab, it does make me save this insurance plan before continuing. And then this is the space where you could punch in what Blue Cross Blue Shield allows for this particular code and any other codes that you would have already put into the system. 
So I could say that Blue Cross allows $40 for this code. And then the PIN section is going to show the provider's name. And I could say Blue Cross requires their Blue Shield provider number show up on the claim. So I'm going to choose Blue Shield provider for this provider. And I'm going to punch in his Blue Shield PIN or ID number so that it does populate on the claim form. Not all insurance companies have a qualifier and a PIN, nor do you have to enter it. It's just based on that insurance plan, and you'll likely know whether or not that's required. I'm going to say we do accept assignment for that, and I'm going to go ahead and save my changes. Now we've created an insurance plan, and we're going to close this screen out and get back to our setup. The accounting setup is complete. Under system setup, there is an SQL tool. As you can see, this is going to be for our total MD support technicians only. So I just want to point out if you have an issue in the system where something doesn't seem to be functioning right, you're going to want to call our tech support team and they may have to use this tool to look at correcting that issue. Jumping over to the left, we're going to look at our additional setup. And then this bottom box is for our EHR components. We're going to save that for another video. Under additional setup, we have setting up multi-codes. Multi-codes are basically combinations of codes that you'd like to bill out together at the same time. For example, you may have an office visit that includes a code for a drug screening and may also include a code for a blood test. So you could have a urinalysis, a blood test, and the office visit code that you bill out all at once. Instead of billing three different codes, why not click one button and get all three codes? The multi-codes is where you set up that combination. So in my options menu, I would click new multi-code. I would label this some sort of descriptor, initial for initial visit. The description could be office visit with blood and your analysis testing. When you go to choose a multi-code to use, you're going to choose based on the description. So make sure the description makes sense to you. Now you can put up to eight codes inside of this multi-code. I'm going to choose the office visit code. And then if I had the blood test and the urinalysis test in the system, I would choose the blood test here and the urinalysis code here. And then I would save my changes and I would have created a multi-code for all three of those items to click with one button instead of having to click multiple buttons. So that's designed to save you time and energy for the things that you commonly bill out together. The next setup is setting up alert codes. We do have a default set of alerts that come with the program such as allergies, back issues, heart issues, etc. Now there's one code that isn't in here that I would want to add and that's a joint replacement code. So this is done alphabetically by code and we've got jaw pain and kidney disease. So in between those two I want to plug in joint replacement. So I'm going to click on new alert from my options menu and the code is going to determine where this item shows up in that list. So I want to make sure that I put it alphabetically. I create that code alphabetically by what makes sense as to where I want to plug that code in. So I put in joint. The name of the alert is going to be joint replacement. And then in the description, I can put in some additional information. And simply save our changes. Now inside of our alert codes, we've got Joplin, joint replacement, and kidney disease. Now every patient that you create, you will have the option to select joint replacement as an issue. Closing out, we're going to go back to our setup screen and click on modify claim pre-edits. Our system essentially has a pre-scrubbing process where it's going to check your claim for accuracy and information before it gets sent off to your clearinghouse if you are sending e-claims. It will scrub those claims even if you are planning on printing them as well. So this is the data that the system is looking for. The name of the facility, the insurance address, the patient's name, patient's address, etc. 
If there is an item that you know for a fact you do not need to include on the claim, you can come here and edit one of those items, let's say the subscriber's street address, and disable it so that the computer is no longer checking for that item. Now if you're missing a subscriber street address on a claim, it won't fail your claim any longer. It will pass your claim as long as all of these other items are there. And then we simply close the screen and we could move on with sending our claims out without worrying that we're having false failures in our opinion. I would caution you to be very careful when using that tool and make sure that you're not excluding items that you shouldn't exclude. Certain clearinghouses do charge per claim that you send, so you want to make sure your claim has the most information that the insurance company might require so that you don't have to pay to resend that claim once again. This is going to conclude our setup of the system. There will be other helpful tips and tricks in our next video as well that pertain more to navigation and customizing of the system. But we've covered all of the highlights of getting some basic information into your system so it's ready for you to go. As always, if you have any additional training questions, please do contact our 800 number, 613-7597, and training is extension 2, and we will be more than happy to set up a training session with you. One last thing I want to point out before we go is that we do have a green question mark in the top right corner of our screen, which is actually a help menu. It's going to give you help for the screen that you are in. So we're in the setup screen. It's giving us setup help. If we go to a different screen, such as setting up the practice, and then we click the help button, we'll have program preferences and practice information help. So if you get stuck along the way, please feel free to use that help button right up there at the top. You can also contact the training department at 1-800 613-7597. Training is at extension 2, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you so much.